Hello everyone. Welcome to the Car Stories Podcast. Your host, James McKeon. And here I am in the wonderful Serial One Honda 600 with a curator here at the Peterson Automotive Museum, Leslie Kendall. This is so interesting for me to be able to drive it uh, with, with somebody who's really interested in it because it means so much to the Japanese industry and to the Japanese market. Yeah. Um, it's this is serial number one, and I don't mean this, the, you know, the first one. No, it is serial number zero zero it zero, zero zero zero. Yeah, it's about things. about eleven zeros and then a one. And then one. And it's it's incredibly interesting because this is where Honda began in America. Yep. They made this in 1967, uh, but it took until 1969 for them to uh, bring in 50 to America. They proved so unsuitable to American roads that they said, well, let's forget that for a while. Uh, and then they, they took all of them back, or they, they said that all of them should be destroyed. Well, three or four, you know, uh, estimates vary, three or four didn't make it. Yep. Uh, they, were, they were retained, as sometimes cars are. And uh, they found their way into the uh, hands of a collectors. And this one was owned by uh, Tom Mings, who, who didn't know what he was buying when he bought it. But you know, when you start digging into it, you, know, you kind of look in the, you, you start figuring out what it is you have. You know, sure. you, 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 you're looking at the uh, serial number, you thought, oh my God, this is serial number one. This is, uh, this is pretty important. Yeah. This is something significant. This one, you know, you have to do this one right. And when you're doing such an early car, I, I don't, I don't envy him at all for having had to, to um, expend the time and time and energy that he obviously had to spend on this car. Because the first of anything, you're going to have a lot of detailed differences in the components and how sure. things fit and how things operate, and it's it's really not a very um, sophisticatedly engineered car. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, they don't have too many mod cons in this car, let's be honest. No, let's, yeah, let's do be honest. <laughs> We're talking about a two-cylinder, although a four-stroke, air-cooled, no fan, so it's, the, it's kind of a good thing if you can keep going. Yes. Uh, not sure how this would hold up in traffic, but my hunch is it would probably be okay. Yep. I don't think 600cc is going to generate that much heat. But speaking of that, Leslie, I was wanting to ask you about how you managed to come to get your role with the actual the Peterson Museum. How did that come about? Um, it, it came about to my parents' great distress that uh, I was the only student, truly, in kindergarten who knew what a Bugatti was. Yep. And it seemed to be a fait accompli. Every report I ever did had something to do with a car. I see. Uh, and then I ended up somehow getting an MBA and was a mortgage loan officer for years and years and I just that was just not a very satisfying uh, line of work and so I quit one day and I went to the San Diego Automotive Museum I volunteered and um, ended up ended up as the uh, uh, tour guide and ended up with the curator sure after about six months and then one thing led to another I did a consultation for the Peterson and uh, then I was hired by the Peterson. So I've been here for almost 25 years. And it's been a, it's surely an enjoyable 25 years, and a nothing has changed, obviously, it, in those 25 nothing, years. Nothing ever changes. It's, everything is just, just static. We're passing a Honda Civic, the modern Honda Civic, which is made with about twice the raw materials of this and one. And is twice the size. And is at least twice the size of this. And it, it looms as such a big car when you're comparing it to this. It does. A Volkswagen Bug in the day would have been a big car compared to this. A Mini would have been a big car. A this. Mini would have been a big car. And a Mini, funnily enough, they might give it away in the name, is not particularly a large car. And No, it's not. People think that the Minis today, well, that's about as big as they were. The earliest Minis, when they were introduced in the late 50s, were very, very small cars. Today, they just they just bear a passing resemblance. Yes. A, a, an identifiable, but still passing resemblance. Yes. Now, interesting, you know, when you talk about heritage vehicles and you talk about um, retro cars, they're making this again. They are? Uh, in, in, in Japan. I was, last time I was in Japan, uh, I was at a stop sign and I saw them a kind of a retro 
modern version of one of these cars. And I'm sure it's going to be the, uh, the K class of cars. Yep, I, I have no doubt. But, um, so yeah, so obviously the renaissance of these cars, and there's, and I will say that people do like seeing you when we're driving around this car. They like seeing the sides, but it's so quaint. Yeah, and you I, know, this car gets noticed. I, I and, and I don't mean just looked at, because there's a big difference between being noticed and being looked at. Yeah. I've driven plenty of cars that exemplify that difference. Yeah. But this one gets noticed. People look at this and they know it's important. They know it's rare. They know it's clever. But they'll, they don't really know about it, which is the reason that the Peterson Automotive Museum exists. We're out there to help tell people why you should be interested in this kind of car, that this car is important. You know, this car started the whole Honda automobile legacy in America. Yep. This very car, serial number one, the, the very car that we're in. Yeah. And, I mean, that legacy, admittedly, obviously, this is why we talk about it being a uh, a small engine car. But it, it is, like we've said, happy and fun. And it fits in with what Honda are making now in regards to the vehicles they're doing and what, really, the direction the automotive world is going. Yeah, yeah. It's... You know, it's a very rational car, and there's no reason... Rational doesn't have to be cheap, yep. or it doesn't have to mean cheap, it doesn't have to mean um, low quality. It, it can, it, rational can be fun. I mean, Ferdinand Porsche was a very rational guy, and look what he came up with. I mean, fascinating stuff. So, speaking of the museum itself, Leslie, what is... And obviously, there's a very variation of cars that we have in the museum. What is say one or two of your favorite cars that we have in the museum and that you're really happy to secure. If I were to tell you what my favorite cars were, I'd have to pick a different one every couple of minutes. Because, That's not me. Because I have these, I don't know, I don't know what you'd call it, but I have these kind of like serial obsessions. Like right now I'm absolutely obsessed with Japanese cars because we're going to present an exhibition on Japanese cars beginning in April. Yep. And we're going to have some of the rare stuff that led up to this car. And this car, this very car, is going to be in that exhibition. So what are some of those cars that you've been chasing down for that new exhibition coming in April? Well, one of the things that I think it's important for people to understand is the Japanese had a vibrant, vibrant auto industry before World War II. Yep. Even during World War II, they made you know, electric cars because of the petroleum shortages. Sure. It was not unusual to have a Japanese electric. Um, when, it, for people that don't know, and I wasn't aware of this, when did really the Japanese automobile industry sort of kick off? When did it begin? Well, it depends on how you, it depends on how you define the Japanese automotive industry, but the first automobile to be a series produced was the Takuri, which was 1917. Okay. A very a car, a car that you wouldn't um, necessarily expect Japan would make. It was a large car. Okay. Kind of a luxurious vehicle because if you could afford a car in 1917. You have to be a little bit wealthy. You could probably afford something like that. Later on, the prices of cars started to come down uh, and it, gasoline started becoming a little bit more available and people in the lower income brackets decided they wanted cars. So that's when they turned to small cars. Sure. And we hope to have one of the very earliest uh, series produced small cars, the Otomo, uh, in the exhibition. We're now, now uh, negotiating with the museum. And so when you go about, what's the process that would happen, for example, if you could talk us through a little bit, tell the listeners, since I'm not aware of this, what's the stage of an exhibition goes through? How does it come from an inception or an idea to then getting put into practice? And what's the sort of time frame we're looking at there? Well, to go through. well what's a, what we do, the very first thing we do is try to determine what's important to people. Yep. What do people want to see? What do people want to learn about? You know, and you know, we've done so many unusual things. You know, we did, we did a, an exhibit on travel trailers mm -hmm. and motor camping. You know, and a lot of people thought, well, who cares about that? But then when you think, wait a minute, yeah. minute no. A lot of people first saw Los Angeles dragging behind them a trailer Certainly. or some other kind of camping gear. Um, but we want to talk about Japanese cars now because you have to admit they're coming into their own. Yes. It's not unusual to go to a Japanese car meet and see Japanese cars 
that are old enough to have grandchildren. Yep. This car next, uh, well, last year, this car was 50 years old. Two days ago, it was still 2017. This car is 50 years old. Although it didn't make it into America for another two years, but this car we're in is a 50-year-old Japanese car.